Welcome to Live Today. Uh, this is a very special edition of Live Today Live. Uh, Memorial Day here in the United States. Um, and even if you're outside watching, uh, I think you're going to appreciate this program because a great story is a great story. But I'm excited to be able to present it today because, you know, I just have a lot of respect for our veterans, for the men and women who put themselves in harm's way uh, to, to stand for the freedoms that you know, the rest of us enjoy, and it's easy to take that for granted, uh, especially those of us who have never served in the military. Um, but, you know, I, I know a lot of people who have and have great respect for them. And so I, I do want to honor them in my own small way. And so we're going to do that today with an incredible, incredible story. So I actually have two guests with me. I have a former Green Beret medic, uh, Gary Bykirk. And he is also a Medal of Honor recipient, and you're going to find out why. His story is now in a book called Blaze of Light. And it was written by a gentleman named Marcus Brotherton, who is an accomplished author, a New York Times bestseller. And so I've got both of them. Uh, this is a story so big that I had to have two people on to tell it. So Marcus and uh, Gary, how are you guys doing today? I appreciate you being here on Life Today Live. Thank you. It's a blessing to be able to be here. Great to be here, Andy. Thanks. So I'm going to let you guys just dive in. Who wants to Who wants to pick up and and give us a little background, and we can get into the sort of the 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 details that um, earned. I, I don't know if earned is the right word, but the the Medal of Honor was, was given for you know very specific reasons. Um, you guys just dive into the story. Randy, as a journalist, this is really one of those stories that just comes along sort of once in a century. And uh, when I heard of it, I knew I immediately had to pursue this with everything I had. Uh, I, I, I heard about the story through a friend of a friend. We were on the phone talking about various uh, uh, military personnel we knew. And uh, this guy told me about a story about a medic who came home from Vietnam and lived inside a cave for 18 months. And I just went, holy cow, this is <laughs> what happened there. So I reached out to Gary. Uh, fortunately, he keeps a, a fairly robust uh, social media presence. And I reached out to him just cold through, uh, through Facebook, introduced myself, said, have you ever considered uh, being featured in a book, writing a book yourself? Let me help you do it. Let me write, your, uh, write it about you. And fortunately, Gary and his wife, Lolly, had already been thinking and praying about writing a book for some time. So this was a really fortuitous meeting. Gary, um, Marcus just said you lived in a cave. Why don't, why don't you back up and, and tell people, you know, what, some of your experience. Uh, Vietnam, uh, a lot of the American people weren't kind to uh, our Vietnam veterans, unfortunately. Uh, and, and so give us a little bit of background as to what happened when you came back uh, and, and why you chose to isolate yourself? Well, after returning from, from Vietnam, uh, I returned with a mission. Uh, because, I, because of an experience I had in a hospital bed, um, I became aware of the fact that there was something greater in life than myself. Uh, I had been a Green Beret, but lying in that hospital bed, I was dying, and I didn't, uh, I didn't have any of the skills or strengths left success in the past enabling me to become Green Beret. Didn't have any of those things that seemed to work when I was battling death. And uh, it, it was at that time that a chaplain came by, asked me if I wanted to pray. I had never prayed in 23 years, never prayed. Hmm. But at that moment, facing death, I just said, uh, okay, um, I'll make a prayer. I said, God, if you're real, I need you. And something happened at that point. Um, I wasn't miraculously healed or anything, but there was an awareness that came over me, uh, a sense of a presence that there was something greater than myself, and that it was greater than death, greater than my fear of dying. And I, I, I guess I, I say that when my courage failed, faith was born. Um, so I had a faith that there was something greater than myself. I left the military in a sense I wanted to really find out who this being was. But I also wanted to go back to school and uh, go on with my medical career. I went back as a pre-med major. I was not there for um, 
any more than maybe a couple of months and I started getting some of the anti-war uh, experiences that many, unfortunately, many Vietnam veterans had, spitting on, getting called names. Um, and so I, There's a horrific story uh, in, in the book, Randy. Uh, one time Gary was in a parking lot, just to give you a sense of how difficult this was. He was in his van in, in a parking lot and students at this university, state university, found out that he was a veteran and so they surrounded his van and began yelling, shoving, spitting at the van, calling his names. I mean, Gary's a, a Green Beret. I mean, if he got out of the van, he could take down several of them, but this is a whole mob of people. And it's horrific in the sense of, can you imagine yourself in a situation? You you come home and Gary did heroic things overseas and you'd think he would be lauded for being a hero. You'd think you'd receive a ticker tape parade, but no, his fellow students, his peers, uh, yeah. and the pressure is mounting. Gary, I'll pick up the story. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, and, and war is a terrible thing. Um, and all of us that, that, that fight in the war um, suffer the same kind of experiences. Uh, I came back, um, I, I did not experience what I say is like a national absolution. Um, it's, a, it's a sense that maybe many of the World War II veterans, the Korean veterans, um, some of the I Iraq and Afghan veterans experienced you come back and you have to deal with all the things you experienced in the war. And uh, you're looking for someone who's just willing to listen, to understand, um, maybe not understand, but just care. Somebody that can give a sense that what you went through, as tough as it was, was appreciated by someone. And that's what I call like a national absolution where your country says, I'm sorry, um, but we know you did it for us. And that helps with the healing. Those of us that came back from Vietnam didn't have that experience. In a, in a sense, what we did, we got accused. We became blamed for the war. I couldn't take that anymore. And on top of all the other anger and the guilt that I felt from the war, I decided that I needed something to uh, protect others because I didn't want to hurt anybody. Plus, also, I wanted to try to protect myself. I wanted to go someplace where I could forget about the war. Um, thinking that, that if I could forget about it, that would be healing. Forgetting mm -hmm. would be would be a step towards healing it. And so what I did was I um, I sought the solitude of a cave in northern New Hampshire. I went back into went back into that cave to try to just refocus, to hide, to try to reflect a little bit, to try to put some sense to what I experienced in the war. Um, but I ended up living in this cave for uh, 18 months, trying to uh, get used to being um, from one war scene, one battle in Vietnam, to now the battleground of trying to work out a life and live back here in the States. Hmm. And I, I couldn't do it, so I said, I'm just gonna go live in a cave. Now, was the, the I mean, that sounds very primitive to us, right, you know, these days, but yeah. was that, um, was that just a place you were comfortable living out in nature, just, uh, you know, away from people? But, I mean, w w was it a comfortable place for you in the sense of inner comfort? You know, it's, it's, it's ironic, Randy. Over the years, I've told my story many, many times. And uh, once they find out that I lived in the cave, they don't want to hear about the battle in Vietnam anymore. They, wanna <laughs> learn. they don't want to know about the Medal of Honor. They want to know, like you said, what is the cave <laughs> like, you know? And uh, I, I learned that when I went to Vietnam, um, living in the jungle and fighting in a jungle was going to be a new experience for me. So I asked this young mountain yard boy who was a 15-year-old who lived in the village that we were in in the middle of the jungle. I said, look, at, his name was Dale. I said, look, at, I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of tigers. You had to help me learn how to survive in this jungle, Dale, because this is scary for me. And he laughed and he said, he said, I don't want to teach you how to survive. He said, the jungle is where we get our life. We live in the jungle. He said, I want to teach you how to live in the jungle. Now, this, that was quite a wise statement from a 15-year-old boy. But over that year that I was with him, he taught me how to live. And when I went to the cave, 
I thought about what Deo had taught me and people said, how did you survive in that cave? I really didn't go into the cave to survive. I went in the cave to try to learn how to live again because I didn't like the way I was living outside. And so I went to the cave to, to live. It, I was very comfortable with it after living in the jungle, um, living and being able to live there because of what Deo taught me. And I think that it was to a large extent, extent what I learned from Deo really helped me to learn how to live in that cave. And I came out of that cave with a new appreciation of life. I came out of that cave with a new message about life. Um, I so, want, go ahead. You know, so, so for me, the cave is um, probably one of the greatest experiences that I've, that I've ever had. Mm -hmm. And I, I cherish uh, that, the time that I spent in the cave. Yeah, I want I want to get to that message and what you what you came out with, but let's back up just a touch uh, to Vietnam, and, and let's talk about what happened that earned you that that medal that you proudly wear, and I honor you for it. When Kerry first went to Vietnam, he he was not even <clears throat> he was not even supposed to go to Vietnam initially, and uh, being a young man and and at Fort Bragg, he got into into some trouble with the law. Uh, in a bar one night and uh due to due to some uh, indiscretions and uh, and the judge sent him to, to vietnam sort of uh, as, as a plea bargain <clears throat> so he was over there and and decided to make the most of it initially he was stationed in a hospital a very elite medic a lot of training 75 weeks of training to to become this green beret medic and um he asked to be sent to an 18 post out in the jungle uh the montagnard people in, intrigued him and so at first he went to this tiny little village called Dac Siang. And it, it, it was great. The, the people were beautiful. They, they were tremendously friendly. They welcomed him into their tribe. He became an honorary tribes member and Gary is chief medic. So it's, he's taking uh, care of the people. He's doing medical workups. He's delivering babies. It, it's, and the people are embracing it. It's this jungle Shangri-La. He's taking the kids swimming down to the river. They're, they're setting up screens and showing John Wayne movies at night. Uh, and, and Gary really found the family that he'd always wanted. All that changes April 1st, 1970. Yeah, it was on April 1st, uh, early in the morning. Uh, we had been surrounded by over 10,000 of the enemy. Mm. And uh, it was just an immediate barrage of uh, artillery rocket fire. And during that time, uh, with very early in the battle, I was... Uh, wounded, uh, wounded in the back and um, it knocked out my spinal cord so I was unable to walk. Uh, and it, But in the midst of that battle, uh, my, that young mountain yard boy that I mentioned, Deo, he found me. And everything that they said that I did to earn the Medal of Honor, I couldn't have done if Deo did not carry me. Hmm. He carried me around as we continued to fight. We continued to help people that were being wounded, continue to drag them down into the bunker, into safety so uh, other people could work on them and, and, and save their lives. But Deo would always uh, take me back out into the battle. Uh, I was shot two more times. Uh, Deo, at my insistence, uh, kept on bringing me back out into the battle, even though people said that I should have stayed down in the bunker where I was safe so they could take care of my wounds. Uh, but Deo continued to bring me out into the battle. We continued to fight. Um, we heard a rocket coming in. Uh, Deo threw me, himself on top of me to protect me, and Deo was killed, mm. uh, protecting me. Uh, two more medics picked me up at that point and continued to carry me through the battle uh, until I was collapsed and then uh, eventually was medevaced by a, uh, by a helicopter that after two or three helicopters had been shot down trying to get in, I was eventually medevaced and brought back to play cool in the hospital. Jeez. One of the reasons that Gary uh, had me write this book in third person point of view is that Gary tells the story a little bit too humbly. I mean, here's, here's this image. This, this elite medic is shot three times in the hip, the stomach, uh, and near the spine. He is paralyzed from the waist down. He cannot walk and his battle is finished. But Gary knows he still has a job to do. He's got to treat people. He's got to treat the wounded. Hmm. And so he calls his helpers to his side. He says, carry me, drag me. 
And this is how Gary uh, continues to administer aid on the battlefield. He is dragged literally from wounded person to wounded person. What's horrific about this situation is that Dak Sang is home to about 400 uh, indigenous fighters and also their wives and children, about 2,300 uh, innocent uh, women, uh, civilians, and children. And so they're all in this village along with the 12 Green Berets. And as these 10,000 soldiers are surrounding the camp, they're just slacking everybody inside, including the women and children. Mm. And so that's who Gary is fighting for. That's who Gary is treating. Uh, women and children, his fellow soldiers, indigenous fighters, paralyzed from the waist down. You know, I mean, to, to those of us who have never been anywhere near such a situation, it just almost seems surreal. I mean, it, it's just hard to comprehend. how. How how did you even survive? I mean, I know you said you got medevaced, but I mean, was it just it's just hard to comprehend. Um, I mean, what about your other fellow soldiers? Did they did they get out too? I mean, was it just a unfortunately was it just a bloodbath? Well, every every all the Americans were wounded uh, very quickly. Uh, we um, nobody. Uh, none of the Americans were killed, although some of them were very seriously wounded and carry some tremendous wounds even to this day. Um, but the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often asked, you know, how did you go on? How could you keep on doing that? Weren't mm -hmm. you afraid? Yeah. And I, I can honestly say that at no time during that experience did I, did I feel fear. Um, I honestly was not afraid because I, I think that you know, there's a saying we had in Vietnam that said, to really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life has a meaning that the protected will never know. And I honestly did not feel any fear. I almost died. Hmm. But to those who fight for it, when I fought at that battle, and what I experienced was a power of something greater than fear. What I experienced was the power of love. What kept me going on and, and fighting was my love for those people seeing them, knowing that they needed somebody to help them. What kept me going was the love that Deo had for me. As I said, Deo carried me, and when and he was shot, and he couldn't carry me anymore, he would drag me. And I still have this image of Deo dragging me, holding me by the shoulders and dragging me, and the two of us looking into each other's eyes when we felt like quitting. And the love that we shared between us, that was greater than any fear that I had of dying. Hmm. It was greater than any fear or temptation that I had to quit. The love that we shared was powerful and that enabled us to keep on going. And eventually that's what enabled Dale to lay on top of me and to give his life for me. That's the power of love. Yeah, I, I'm guessing I'm guessing that the scripture that says, you know, that there's no greater love than a man lays down a life for his friend has an entirely uh, more you know, personal meaning to you. Right, when I first read that, uh, which is part of how I came to Christ. A, a good friend of mine just asked, gave me a, a New Testament and asked me to do him a favor and read it. And so I was reading through it. And when I came to John 14, um, that, what, that, that portion of John 14, John 15, John 13, those portions there um, really impacted me. And I thought about Dale and the love that we shared. Mm. Um, it was a Love is a, is a powerful, it's the greatest gift that we can give to each other. So that's why you say when, um, you know, when I love somebody that, as you said, you know, to really live, you must almost die. Mm. Uh, to those that fight for it, life has a meaning the protected will never know. Also, love has a meaning that the protected will never know. Mm. And the love is really reciprocal there. Um, at one point in the battle, Gary asked Dale, you know, do you want to leave? Please leave. Please find somewhere safe. And, and Dale says, no, <clears throat> I, where I belong is right here with you. Mm. You are my family. Mm. Uh, well, again, we're talking, we're talking about the powerful story that is in this book. I want to show you it's called Blaze of Light there. And you're looking at Marcus Brotherton's website. And he is the author of the book uh, about the life of former Green Beret medic Gary Bykirk uh, and you can see on Gary's neck that Medal of Honor. So Gary when you 
returned back uh, to the United States, you, you were not received well, as shamefully many of our veterans were not. Um, two questions. Uh, you, when you went to isolation in, in the cave in New Hampshire, uh, your, your refuge, one, how were you physically? If you were paralyzed in the, in the battle, was that something that was corrected pretty quickly? Or, or is that something that you struggled with and maybe even still struggle with? And then second, you talked about what you came out of that cave with, and I'd like to hear about that. First of all, how, are, how are, were you and how are you physically? Well, I, I still have some, uh, I'm 100% disabled from uh, the, the wounds. I still have shrapnel in my spinal column. Hmm. Um, I don't have much feeling below my waist, but I have all the motor coordination and the motor movement. Uh, so that's been a blessing. Um, I was uh, fearful that I'd never walk again. Um, but after that prayer that I made and I felt that presence that come into my, uh, that I had after my prayer, I wasn't afraid if I'd never walk again. You know, I, I knew that there was something greater than me that would be able to help me. Hmm. And that not only that, but loved me. Um, and, and when I went into the cave, uh, I don't know if you have time to go into the experience, but I, I said that when I came back, I was on this mission of trying to find out more about this God that I knew was real. And I went down to Massachusetts where my cousin lived and her husband, and I knew that they had a faith. That they, and so I wanted to find out about the faith that they had. And that's when he gave me a Bible and just asked me to do him a favor and read. And he gave me a New Testament. Um, on July 2nd, 1973, at 3 o'clock in the morning, when I read that portion of Scripture, I, uh, in John 14, where it says, Let not your heart be troubled. I am, and I said, Okay, yeah, my, my heart is troubled. I'm filled with guilt and anger and hurt. But he said, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? And I said, Yes, I believe in God. I met him in a hospital bed. Hmm. He said, Believe also in me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, July 2nd, 1972, um, I knelt down in a trailer and accepted Christ as my Savior. At that point, I knew that God had forgiven me, but I still couldn't forgive myself. And I still didn't feel that national absolution. I didn't feel the forgiveness from my country. I still was harm, uh, taunted by that guilt that I felt. And so that's when I went into the cave. I went into the cave as a Christian, and I took my Bible with me. And ironically, it was while I was in the cave that I learned I was being awarded the Medal of Honor. So you got, here I am in the cave trying to forget about the war, and now I'm, being, I'm finding out they're going to give me a medal for something. I went to Washington. I reluctantly accepted the medal. I came back to that cave, and now I said, God, um, here I am trying to forget about it, and you're giving me a medal. You must have some kind of purpose for this. And so I started praying, not only to help me understand about life and about Vietnam and what happened to me, but I needed to try to understand what this Medal of Honor meant. And there was a verse that I found in the Psalm that says, man that is in honor and understands not is like a beast that perishes. So I took this honor that God had given me and I said, okay, God, what does it mean? Help me to try to understand it. And what I under began to understand, Randy, was that this Medal of Honor is not about me. God didn't give it to me because of something that I did in one particular day. It's not what he wanted me to understand in getting this medal. He wanted me to understand that this medal represents something greater than one person, greater than one person who did anything on one day. Hmm. The honor that comes with this medal is the honor that it represents millions of men and women, hmm. millions of women and women who have done so much, sacrificed so much, who are willing to die because they love this country, because they love freedom greater than themselves. And he helped me to understand that this Medal of Honor also says to, a message to all who see it, that there's a different way to live your life, caring for others more than yourself. Hmm. So I came out of that cave with a message that this Medal of Honor is for others. It's not about me. I came out of that cave with a message that there's a different way to live your life, caring for others more than yourself. To really live, you must almost die. Maybe not die physically, but die to yourself, caring for others. Because those who fight for life has a meaning to protect it will never know. 
Hmm. And so I came out of that cave sharing that message. But most importantly, sharing this message that the medal is not about me, and I don't wear it for anything that I've done. Hmm. I wear it for God and for his honor. Because without his grace, I wouldn't have survived Vietnam. Hmm. Without his love and his forgiveness, I would not be able to live outside of that cave. I would still be living in a cave if I had not experienced the love and forgiveness that God gives. And knowing that, I am willing and was able to come out of that cave and share his message. Randy, for people unfamiliar with the Medal of Honor, it is the highest, most prestigious distinction uh, given in the United States for acts of valor above and beyond the call of duty. It was created in 1861, and since that time, there have only been uh, slightly over 3,500 people, military personnel, who've ever received it. You consider the millions of people who have served in the military. Uh, it, it's so difficult to receive. It's often awarded posthumously. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, I believe there are uh, about 80, I think, is the number. There's 70. 70. Uh, living Medal of Honor recipients, so very difficult to receive. Marcus, when what made you reach out and, and want to write this story? I mean, it, it's yes, it's it's a, a great story in the sense of the the courage on the battlefield, um, and you know the transformation. Uh, uh, you know, a man goes to a cave and finds purpose in life. But what what made you say, you know, what I have to tell this story to other people? Uh, a couple of things there, Randy. First of all, Gary's is great to work with, very polite, very professional. Uh, we enjoyed a great working relationship. Um, early on, I sensed that that the, the message of Gary's story is very broad. It, it's not simply a military story. It's really, we, we dedicated the book to anyone who's ever fought through a battle or sheltered in a cave, because we all face obstacles in our life, things that we have to overcome. And the and and part of the 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 temptation sometimes is to is to isolate ourselves. Sometimes we're forced to do it. Sometimes we we do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and good things sometimes can happen from isolation. But as Gary's story shows, and as Gary will testify, that really it was the love of the people uh, surrounding him that really brought him out of the cave for good, mm -hmm. and helped him return to society and helped him heal ultimately. It was him reaching out and others reaching out to him and him developing this trust. And that's the message for all of us today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, have, what have you been doing, Gary, for the last 45 or so years? What, what, have, what have you done? Well, after I uh, uh, came out of the cave, I went to seminary, um, Learned, tried to be a associate pastor for a short time. Quickly learned I was not called to be a pastor, <laughs> as my wife can tell you. Uh, and, and quite ironically, my the only reason that my I came out of the cave was I met this girl in the small town of Lancaster, New Hampshire. Fell in love with her and asked her to marry me, and she said, "Okay, but you got to come out of your cave because uh, I'm not going into that cave." So she's been my partner for 45 years, and she's been a very important part of this story. She's one of the reasons, along with God, she's one of the people that came into that cave and brought me out. Um, she went with me as I tried to uh, tried out being a pastor for a short time. That didn't work, but I loved working with kids. I used to love to work with the, maybe because of the uh, my experiences in Vietnam with the with the mountaineer children and my experience with Dale. Yeah. I felt a real burden for young people, knowing that there was a potential inside of them with each of them, that they could make a difference and they could do tremendous things. And it doesn't matter if you're a young person or not. Uh, Dale was only 15, but he had a tremendous, tremendous impact on my life. So because of this um, experience with Dale and because of my experience with the young people uh, in Maine, because I was an associate pastor in a small little town up in Maine, I decided to go into uh, uh, go back to graduate school, and I got a uh, got a master's degree in counseling. And I spent the last spent 33 years working as a middle school counselor, wow. trying to share with young people what I call the life lessons, life lessons that I learned in the cave, life life lessons about how to live rather than just survive. That there's a difference between surviving and living. Mm -hmm. And I wrote started writing all these life lessons in the cave and. I, I spent 33 years trying to share with young people um, about life, uh, lessons that, that would help them learn how to live life fully. 
to live life the way that God wants us to have a life. And so it's been a, a been a wonderful 45, 50 years now. Mm. Yeah, you, I, I love the fact that that you recognize that you weren't called to be in a church. As someone who works at a 501c3 right now and is classified as a ministry, I hear people all the time say, oh, I wish I could be in full-time ministry. And I look at them and go, you, 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 sh you are, or you should be, you know? Yeah. So to see you there going into, I'm guessing, public schools and, and counseling, that's full-time ministry. So I love, I love the example you set, even on that front. Yeah, I, it's, it's one of the, uh, the greatest things that I could have done. I, I wanted to be a, I was called, I thought I was called to be a Green Beret. I thought that was my niche. I was going to be a professional soldier. Um, but the, I took the things that the Green Berets taught me and I used them in middle school. I say that Vietnam was good training for working with middle schoolers. You know, the things that I learned in Vietnam were good preparation for working with seventh graders. <laughs> you can survive two weeks in the seventh grade classroom. You can, can serve up, you can survive any battle. <laughs> And Gary is chaplain of the Medal of Honor Society today, uh, spends a lot of time in, in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, helping people, ministering to people. So. Oh, uh, Marcus, I appreciate you bringing his story to life for the rest of us. And you guys out there, go pick up Blaze Light. Um, give it to somebody you know that you know it'll mean something to them. It's available now. And it not just a, a great story of an individual man, a, a hero, but a great story of, of what God can do uh, with, with any of us. Uh, you know, re redeem a life, give us purpose, uh, give us fulfillment and happiness. Marcus, what, uh, what, what is kind of your bottom line message that you want people to get, walk away from when they read that book? It's a book for everybody. There's this tremendous story in, uh, near the end of the book where uh, Gary has a chance to return to Vietnam, and this is after the war ends. And he's, uh, he's actually the first Medal of Honor recipient to return to the country, and by then it's under communist control. And so th it's a very difficult thing even just to get into the country. And while he's there uh, with, his, with his delegation, they, they tour a number of sites and, and meet with various um, government representatives, and, and they make some inquiries into uh, still missing POWs. Uh, it, it's a productive trip. Mm. One of the best parts of the trip comes at the very end, where Gary uh, has a chance to meet uh, an officer who who fought for the other side. He's an enemy soldier. And Gary and this man are talking and, and, and they're sort of showing each other their, their wounds and, and discussing the various battles uh, they've been through. And, and the other man has experienced a lot of suffering as well. Mm -hmm. Lost family members, he, he's been wounded. And, and Gary says, how did you cope? And, and, and the man says, well, uh, I've been through a lot but I learned to forgive. I learned to heal through forgiveness. I think that message just resonates with everybody. Yeah. G Gary, what do you hope people take away from your story? Mm. Well, as Marcus has said, we, we dedicated this to all who have fought through a battle or sought shelter in a cave. And, um, and, and what I hope that they people find and take from find in our story and take from our story that life is a precious, precious gift that we've been given. And although we've, we often face tremendous battles that many times force us to want to go into our own little caves, there's also a God who is with us. He walks with us through every battle. And uh, in, the, in the book, you'll see that God was close to me even at eight, 18 months old when I fell out of a window and my cousin was praying for me. God intervened at that point to save my life. Throughout my whole life, there were many, many battles that faced it. And looking back on it, I can see the presence of God there. So we hope people will take away the fact that, yes, you may be fight facing battles, but there's a God who, who loves you, who wants you to experience life with him. He wants you to experience his daily presence in everything you're going through. Yeah. And he wants to go into any cave that you may find shelter in he wants to go into that cave with you and bring you out so that you can you can experience life with him. I hope that they find words of words of faith. I hope that they can find words of hope. And I hope that they can find words that will bring love into their life. You know, there's a we took the title, I guess, from a, a blaze of light from a line in a poem, 
Actually, it's from the song Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen. Mm. And there's one of the verses of that song says that there's a, a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which you heard, either the holy or the broken hallelujah. And a blaze of light is in every word. It's in every experience. There's a blaze of light, a blaze of God's presence. And we hope that in the words of the story, they will find the blaze of light. Because in, in this life that we go through and in the battles we fight, Many times we will give out a holy hallelujah and tremendous praise, but at the same time, there's many times we will bring out a broken hallelujah. Like I gave in that hospital bed, God, if you're real, I need you. That was a broken hallelujah. But in that broken hallelujah, God brought a blaze of light into my life. Mm -hmm. And we hope that people will find a blaze of light in the words of our story. Mm -hmm. I thank both of you for sharing the story, Gary, for sharing your story, Marcus, for putting it to, to paper eloquently, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to share it with us on Life Today. All you guys out there watching, uh, be sure to share this interview, be sure to pick up this book, Blaze of Light. You can get it anywhere. Uh, you're looking right now at MarcusBrotherton.com so you can learn about it there, but you pick it up wherever you get books, share it with people, and do, if you haven't followed this channel or subscribed to this channel, depending on where you're at, please do that now so you can see more great interviews and share this with some, somebody you know that uh, this will mean something to them. That's it for today. Please join us next time again on Life Today Live. And to all of our great uh, men and women uh, who serve this country, we honor you today on this Memorial Day. See you next time.